afternoon all. I thought I'd like to do an interesting discussion video uh, about trying not to calculate anything. Uh, a lot of you might hold calculation in very high regard, like candidate moves, looking at variations. You might hold this all in very high regard. And you might find this example shocking. Okay, Magnus Carlsen was playing black here. And White just played knight e5 attacking the queen. So if I give you 20 seconds here, I wonder what you would play and why. So 20 seconds starting from now. Okay, well, you might want to pause the video. Well, basically, a lot of analysis was done by White in this position, Luke McShane, and very, very little analysis of variations was done by Magnus. And you might think, how is this possible? And what did Magnus pl play which reflected this? And more importantly, why? And I want to discuss why at various different levels of abstraction. Magnus played the move queen d6 and the interesting thing is he pointed out in post-mortem and i'm pretty sure he wasn't joking that he rejected queen b5 in this position because b3 and there's not much counterplay here okay that's basically what he said you know with not much counterplay the queen uh, but if we look at it in more detail just at an abstract level uh, the queen coming here is away from the king and you can actually do a numerical count of potential attacking pieces that there's actually four attacking pieces here and just three here and also you might want to consider this pawn as almost an attacking unit Kasparov has indicated pawns next to the king almost can be counted as attacking pieces more dangerous perhaps if it was on h6 at some point or closer to the king but even on g5 it could be dangerous so intuitively, even without tons of analysis of queen b5, it might be the case that Magnus's move is actually better. Magnus played queen d6, and now this is an important paradox to really, really, really think about because it has big implications. First of all, this numerical counts business comparing the number of attacking pieces with the number of defending pieces, you might think is absolute nonsense. Can that actually be used in the process of, of thinking about chess? Well, actually, a recent video was about interfering with the opponent's forcing moves. And shortly after doing that video, and I'll give you the link in the description, it occurred to me that the very first example, I was actually removing one of the opponent's attacking pieces in a particular sector of the board to be able to queen the pawns. And you can see that if you are thinking in terms of uh, the relative attackers and defenders in a sector of a board. That is an important generalization. Uh, looking at the sources, the actual very sources of forcing moves, where do forcing moves come from? Forcing moves come from pieces in a particular sector of the board, usually around the opponent's king, because forcing moves like checks, you can't do anything about checks. So if you compare literally the number of pieces around the king and the number of pieces defending, you might, on general principles, on general principles of such accounts, uh, discount queen b5. And the very interesting thing about this game is that Luke Mache must have spent, I think, more than half an hour analyzing various pawn sacrifices on b2 and rook sacrifices and almost making the attack work and being really prepared for queen b5. And a lot of energy was spent, mental energy, and and the interesting thing as well is that in the game after the, the move queen d6 was played after all this energy was played he misses a simple forcing move from black uh, which at least equalizes knight takes g5 because the queen's actually useful it's around the king and it's also got its own forcing moves available with it then actually now if queen takes we have bishop takes f6 and if bishop g5 then f6 and the attacking pieces have started to, started to be repelled and then Magnus went on to grind a win from there. So there are various things 
We're told in Kotov's Think Like the Grandmaster about candidate move trees and analysis. I think that's very well suited to computers. Why is it very well suited to computers and not to us? Well, the simple matter is we can't calculate millions of positions like computers do, like bean counters. Imagine tons and tons and tons of bean counting in this position. Uh, then you might think, yeah, queen b5 might be justified. Uh, com compared to queen uh, d6. After knight e5, you might think queen b5, you might try and work it out. So you analyze all the candidate moves after queen b5. And we could do a technical analysis, but I just want to explore this other idea first. What we're talking about, what are we talking about when we're comparing the number of attacking pieces with the number of defending pieces? We're talking about a causal analysis. Cause, not effect. So, like symptoms are caused by causes, yeah. If you if you want to avoid a cold, you you sometimes might not want to go to places where you could pick up a cold. Having to deal with a cold is a pain. So what you try and do is determine cause, and a causal analysis in a chess position is on an abstract level. We're given equipment to assess positions, evaluate positions, since the very first world champion. For example, past pawns, king safety, pawn structure, the bishop pair, centralization, the importance of the center, different types of center. Help us evaluate and determine cause, not effect. A causal analysis here implies actually you can try and quickly determine that if you want to keep the count of defensive pieces relatively in balance to the attacking pieces, then on intuition to play the move queen d6 is very, very interesting. What does our bean counter tool toolkit say if we did analyze this position? So on depth 14, 15, queen b5 is mentioned and we've got queen d6 as the second candidate. So queen d6 is Magnus's move and now on depth 16, queen d6. So what is going on here with queen b5 anyway? So intuitively we can think it's a piece away from the king. So that abstract count of the attacking pieces versus defensive pieces is in White's favor after Queen B5. And I think some people might have mentioned that intuitively. You often see games on this channel where as soon as the Queen goes away from the King, the King gets mated. We've seen a number of examples of that in Tau games, for example, on this channel, or in other attacking games where the Queen's actually um, distracted maybe with some bait and then the Queen is slaughtered because basically it's to do with abstract reasoning. One player perhaps is intuitively thinking about this. Counts of attacking pieces and defensive pieces will be a cause of forcing moves which are irresistible. And in fact, you, you might think this is a joke, surely. But no, Kasparov as well. There's a very famous game, Kasparov against Karpov, in the Royal of Pez, which Kasparov has labelled the punishment. And his notes, his, he talks about the game, and he talks about the number of attacking pieces versus defensive pieces as a ratio, and keeps referring to that ratio. And it's more than just a joke. This is more than just a joke. So this causal analysis is something which you might think is common sense to think about causes. But are we, why are we lured in chess to want to look at candidate move trees? The lure is basically in forcing sequences in particular. Forcing sequences can transition games dramatically, so you need to calculate those as very high priority because the branches are very few. But as, as a generalization, as humans, we're not very good at calculating. And OK, we can calculate forcing moves. And a lot of the brilliancies we call masterpieces and immortal games they have these fantastic moves, but if you look at a lot of them, they're to do with king safety and forcing moves in particular. In in the general sense, we want to bear our intuition, our patterns. Chess on a human level is a patterns war. It's a war of patterns. It's not a war of bean counting. And I think that's a really, really interesting concept. It it shows it might be about bean counting because sometimes people calculate and they find amazing variations, but often a large ingredient of that is forcing moves. But chess is really a patterns war, and it has been since the advent of Steinitz, the first world champion, looking at the elements of chess. But 
not just the, the, the patterns of position, you can look at more abstract patterns like counterplay, number of attacking pieces versus defensive pieces. So here it seems white is actually better. The computer has worked out at depth 23 by the way, that white is better with bishop takes g7, king takes g7. So is it going to confirm what we see that the queen is away from the king? It's a fundamental fact. There's one less defensive piece near the king. Let's have a look at rook e1. And now it's difficult in fact for the queen to even come back because the knight is covering d7. How is the queen actually coming back to the defense? And this would be a very, very different game. White has uncomfortable pressure. Say knight g8, okay, and now b3, which Magnus mentioned earlier. Uh, in, I mean, he mentioned that b3 initially. Queen, queen a5, what does queen a5 do? It's again, it's material grabbing, but visually we know as human beings, we've got more pieces around the king than is defending it. And in this position, this, this would technically, apparently be, be troublesome for black. Knight d7, and what is the actual threat of knight d7? It's now queen e5 check, major threat of queen e5 check. And look how useful that pawn is for holding up f6. So we've done something which seems idiotic to move the queen away from the king. Just from a numerical count perspective, an abstract perspective of the number of attacking pieces versus defensive pieces in a particular sector of the board, we can argue that the intuitive move triumphs what we can calculate as human beings. Sometimes we need to throw away the calculation aspects of chess and really focus on causal reasoning, on, on the patterns war, the war of patterns. And I'm not sure it's been described like that before, so this is something to think about. There's a war of patterns going on here, and black by playing queen d6, but nevertheless, Magnus is seeing forcing moves because his next move goes from this very, very intuitive move to a very, very tactical move straight off the bat. He's looking at forcing moves as well. So he hasn't thrown away completely the human side of calculation. But where the human side of calculation really excels is in the calculation of forcing moves. So knight takes g5 was found. So we have here two profoundly different uh, results of different types of thinking. The move queen d6 followed by the move knight takes g5. This is like uh, Jekyll and Hyde. It's, it's such a contradiction in thinking style, but Magnus has mastered clearly both types of thinking. And if we did go material hunting for those interested, so let's like take the pawn on b2 as well. It will just, just show even more that what is the queen doing away from the king? So say we go for, let's say queen f3. And I think there's a lot of analysis by Luke Michelin on, on, on a video somewhere about this. Queen takes b2 and there might be a way for white to sacrifice the rook even. So even this, bishop takes g7 is not maybe completely losing for white. It's not ludicrous because we see the queen away from the king. We have a numerical superiority of pieces here around the king. So in this position, this might actually get quite dangerous if, if black's not careful. So already, look, you see queen g4. And why would this be a shock to see the engine ch changing its mind? What we can see as human beings is patterns. That's what we can see. And it's like confirming what we already saw. So do we do we kind of try and work like a computer inefficiently? Because a computer can calculate many more millions of positions than us. Or do we sometimes trust our instinct? Our instinct is dealing with what I'd call the patterns war. It's causal reasoning. reasoning. What is the cause of forcing moves? Have you ever asked that? The cause of forcing moves or the cause of attacks to be undefendable? The numerical counts of attacking pieces versus defending, defending pieces. And I think just to reinforce this point, we'll take uh, the Kasparov Karpov game in a later video where he destroyed Kar Karpov's king side. And we'll look at from a numerical perspective of attacking versus defensive pieces. Anyway, I just, I just thought this is something I wanted to get out there. This idea of chess as a patterns war. And the illusion of calculation is really often celebrated with forcing moves to get to get rewards for calculation. It's usually forcing moves, which which can be really decisive in games. But you see here Magnus using both toolkits, intuition ruling out very very quickly Queen B5 on the on the basis of B3 without much counterplay, uh, versus the huge amount of calculation 
by white on queen b5 and the ramifications of that. But then on the very next move, white blunders, maybe exhaustion, etc., has set in. And he should have played h4 defending g5. When white is actually okay, white's actually got a promising position. But it was all wrecked. Uh, so, comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.